There once was a ship, but to the skies the name of the ship was the Enterprise. And they sails lit, her phasers armed, oh blow, you red shirts blow. Soon may the flagship come, bring a survey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Been not two weeks from sector one when we were sacked by Romulans. Red alert was called, when captain said, torpedoes make it so. Soon may the flagship come, bring us Earl Grey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Before our foe had reached the hull, the shields were raised and power at full. Screen went dark, the Romulans gone when they engaged their cloak. Soon may the flagship come, bring us Earl Grey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Hello everyone and welcome to the Star Trek Wars Council Roundtable, movies edition, and this time we're looking at The Voyage Home, Star Trek Four, or Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Because it's a weird one on the, the UK VHS, it said The Voyage Home, colon Star Trek Four. Don't know why, just a bit of yeah. random, insane trivia there. Um, I'm Senior Council Member James King, and joining me for this one are Lainey. Howdy. And Joe. Yes, they managed to find me, but I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're here from the start this time. And we have both Alex's um, coming to us live from which park are you in, Alex? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the name of the park. I don't know. I'm in Oklahoma City, for anyone who knows or cares where that is. That's where I am. Excellent. And Star Trek Falls greatest fan, Alex. Hi! <laughs> You've embarrassed her. I'm so first before this is over. Hello. Don't this... pick too early. This is the one we've been waiting for, Alex. This is your, your moment. This is where you're going to tell us all about it. But, yeah, before we get going, then, um, let's talk about how we first came across the film. Um, Joe, what about you? When did you first so, see Star Trek Four? What were your thoughts? Okay, so, um, so you, um, you all got my opinions on Star Trek Three and a little epilogue there. Um, before the last one, I didn't get to say how I saw that one. The answer is, I just saw it literally then. But I can definitely, you know, know how that normally is for me. But I can say I have actually seen this one before. In fact, several times. No idea when it was. I think I was younger. I was definitely younger. I mean, that that's how this works, isn't it? That's how time works. I'm sorry, the time travel elements confused me. But I think I was a possibly a teenager at the time. That's all I can remember. I do remember enjoying it. Um, I think we had it, actually, I think we had it on VHS along with Star Trek V. Don't know where we got the Star Trek V on for, but four was good, and I definitely enjoyed that one at the time. So it was good to go back to this one, because as I said before, I'd seen uh, Wrath of Khan. I hadn't seen the first one or the third one. So I've finally now actually seen the entire of the so-called trilogy. So it was nice having that background to it. Um, and that's basically where I am from that. Excellent. And um, Lainey, what about you? I couldn't honestly tell you. I think this one is the one that gets shown on telly all the time. Yeah. So it's got to have been that I've just watched it because they've shoved it on on a Saturday evening. Um, but it's probably the one I've watched the most. Well, of the original cast. The, uh, definitely the, yeah, definitely the one I've watched the most of the original series. Um I, I'm partial to a bit of Nemesis, so we'll wait a few months Ooh. and we'll talk about that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Cersei, what about you? Uh, I saw this one, to Lainey's point, this one is on TV, at least in the States, a lot, probably the most out of all of them. It, definitely the original movies, anyway. Uh, and I loved it. You know, I was a teenager, 12, 13, 14. And then I remember when I got to see it on VHS, and especially, you know, because on TV, you don't get to hear any of that language. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you get to, it's kind of like a second view of the movie. But yeah, this has always been a real favorite one of mine, too. I mean, I'm happy for it. Yeah, that was, I was going to ask you, actually, about uh, the TV version, because I, I, I think I saw this, I rented it on video, I think. 
um, from Eileen, Eileen, who I mentioned last time. <laughs> and um, yeah, she had Star Trek 4. So I think I'd rented it on video because there was an advert for TNG on it. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was like going further into the future with the next generation. And it was like, Geordie, a man with extraordinary vision. And it is really cheesy <laughs> advert. Um, but yeah, I did have the TV version taped. And as Alex said, they cut out all the, you know, in inverted commas, swearing, the colourful metaphors. <laughs> um, so you get, like, these, all that is cut. And so the you get that big long scene where Kirk's talking to Spock and they're walking down and there's the beautiful shot of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then as Kirk says, so what else did you learn from your mind meld? The shot changes and it's them walking away so you don't see the bridge. Uh, and on the TV edited version, because the first part of that conversation is all about colourful metaphors, they cut the entire thing so you don't get that lovely shot of the Golden Gate Bridge. And you don't get the bit where Aww. it shows the whales getting cut up and stuff like that. So it is quite a <laughs> quite a different film in the the certainly you don't the get to see whales being butchered. Two, exactly. Two other things. Two other things that I know used to be. I think this this has been changed, but I know back at the time when it, uh, it came out on video, they cut out the part where check uh, check off asked for nuclear vessels because that was politically incorrect. That's like the best bit. That's. It's supposed to be politically incorrect. That's the joke. Anyway, um, so I've saved the best for last. Alex, tell us all about your experience with Star Trek IV. Okay. Um, so it's probably a teenager. Uh, thing on how I'm like barely 22 right now. Oh, um, maybe. Uh, so I kind of attribute it to being like my first like legit Star Trek experience. Um, I think I saw it on TV first, and then I did the movie. I don't remember which was which, but I, that's that was like my thing where it's like I first saw that as a movie, Star Trek original series, and then that's like what opened the door into like all the other Star Trek. Oh, it's your gateway drug. <laughs> a gateway movie. I think it is a good. It is a good gateway drug. This movie because. Everybody seems to like this film, even if you're a hardcore Trekkie or not. And it does have that broad mass appeal, and I'm sure we'll get into the whys and wherefores of all that. But it is definitely one that just about anybody can watch. And I think th this is one of the bits of trivia that my brother Elliot always comes out with, and I'm not entirely sure where he get it from, so I'm not entirely sure it's true. Um, but... He he says that apparently this script was that well liked that if it hadn't have come off as a Trek script, they would have reworked it into some other some other form of comedy. You know, just uh, the idea of people from the future coming back to the eighties is got that inherent sort of comedy built into it that they were going to run with it anyway. So yeah, I can see this drawing people in definitely. Um, shall we just jump on to the pros then? Um, who wants to go first with the pros for Star Trek Four? Do you want to just we let Alex go first? Yeah, do you want to just run with it, Alex, since this is your? Sure. All right. <laughs> so, start at the beginning. The opening. Awesome. Obviously. <laughs> so, okay. So the music's great. Music's great. Opening scene's great because they have the um. I forget what the, the number is called, but it's got like that light little number and, you know, it's got the uh, names going across the screen and it's like all happy and stuff. It's just, like, it's a great opening. Um, then, then I like, uh, so they do like sort of like the backstory with the Klingon, like showing what happened in the previous film. So like, why are we where we are right now? Here's what happened sort of previously. Here's, here's like the setup for why why this thing exists. And it's like, hey, Klingons were mad this last film. Um, Kirk did all this and now he has a Klingon ship. Now he's trying to get home. So it so so it like sets you up for, you know, like sort of like what the rest of the film is, like why they why they're trying to go home and then also sets off like the ending. Um and then uh Spock and um 
got Spock, Kirk, and uh, Bones like banter at the beginning when he like he lost his memory, obviously. But it's cute. It's so cute. Um, and then um, going home, space cigar. Mm, that's a pro and a con. It's awkward shape, but I like the space cigar. It's it's cool. Fox the whales. It's awesome. Um, and then time travel. I like how they brought that back from um. Tomorrow's yesterday, the whole slingshot around the sun. They're like, hey, remember that thing we did in that one episode, that one time? How about we do that again? I, we, we know it works. Probably works. Let's do that again. Um, so that was fun. Shatner's book, Star Trek movie memories. Like, he goes over, like, how the movie was made and, like, all this stuff. And one of the things, like, he mentions is, like, when they're filming the on-the-street scenes, a lot of that was people walking past. Like, they stop them to, like, Hey, can you tell me where the nuclear vessels are in Alameda? And they're just like, oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> Probably in Alameda. Yeah, um, but it's, those like, are like it's like genuine. random people off the street, isn't it? Like, and they, um, so I, I listened to the commentary, and um, apparently the woman who says that, she's like, I think it's over the bay in Alameda. <laughs> she was meant to be uh, just an extra, and she improv the line, so they then had to sign her up and pay her and get her <laughs> yeah. in like the acting uh, union and all of this business. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah, nice yeah, work. They, they just stop these people and they're like, "Hey, what's happening?" And they like gave like genuine genuine responses. So that was pretty cool. Um, uh, then. The bus scene, obviously, with the um the rocker, the rocker dude playing his loud music, um, Spock doing his little Vulcan thing. That was awesome. Everyone just starts to laugh. That was a great scene. Do you guys know, real quick, I'm sorry, the guy, the punk on the bus is Kirk Thatcher? Yes, I have heard that name before. Yeah, he's one of the associate producers on the staff, I think it was. But yeah, he just had that cameo, and that was him. So Spock getting to do that, I always thought, too. A member of the crew was cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then then we meet the whales, obviously. Spock swimming with the whales. That that was, was awesome. I wish I could swim with whales and Leonard Nimoy. And Leonard Nimoy. He might... I don't know how you're going to manage that somehow, unless you have a time machine. Yeah, I don't know. Or you're okay with, either that or you're okay swimming with bones. No, Leonard Nimoy, right. not DeForest Kelly. Ha ha ha. You know what I meant. Yeah. Uh, pizza, pizza scene. Like, do you like, are, well, they're, they're going to get food, and it's like, do you like Italian? I like Italian. Well, I like Italian. Yes. You like so Love Italian. <laughs> it's just like, because Spock just like so confused, like I don't do I do do I look no do I like Italian and he's just like Kirk just answered for him he's like no yeah you, you totally love it we're great we'll we'll have whatever you want um that I think I think that like summarizes like their relationship right there where Kirk's just like <laughs> here here's what we're doing Spock and Spock would just go along with it like and okay that was improvised by the actors as well it wasn't it, it wasn't in the script and it were it was Shatner and Nimoy like riffing on each other so yeah it does show the sort of chemistry they've got between the two of them. Yeah, it's been the character so long, like, at that point, they're just like, this is probably what would happen. Um, and then, um, you know, I, Liv and I was uh, only working out of space, so great, great line. Um, Naughty doing the whale tanks, also great. Um, the little computer, <laughs> just use the keyboard. It's, there's so many great quotes in here. It's like every every quote is awesome. Just every single single line is just memorable. You can just recite the whole thing. Um, I liked um they they cut out a scene with um Sulu at at the beginning. Um, they were supposed to find out where they go. He's supposed to talk to like a little boy who's supposed to be his great 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 grandfather or something. Um, and they cut that out because the kid crying too much and his mother was like super overprotective um and they're like they're like you know we, we're not we're not gonna deal with this um and they ended up like cutting that whole scene and instead they just like they just looked it up on the they had the they had the scene where like they went to the map and just like oh how will we find it there 
and Spock does his whole like logical thing and curse like, mm-hmm, if we just read the side of the bus. Um but Celia Silly I feel like Celia should have had a bigger part, but you know, he did good with, with what there was. So yeah. it was pretty cool. It's um, it's very much like a, a Kirk and Spock movie, this one. I know yeah. the other guys get yeah. things to do, but it's it's really yeah. them two, isn't it? Yeah, they they cut they cut out a lot of the bigger themes that they were gonna have for those other characters. Um but they, it was it was all right. And then um you know, taking taking the whales home, putting them in the whale tank, um, getting back uh oh but or Kirk's just like Oh well, I guess you just have to make make a guess, and Spock's just like, um, what's a guess? <laughs> uh, guess I'll just have to guess about the, how much this water in these whales weigh. Um, but you know, Kirk's just like, no, nah, I feel I feel safe about about you guessing. I I feel like you'll get us home. I think that also says a lot about their their characters, like Kirk, how much Kirk would trust. Spock with his life, even without his like memories of like what happened, he'd still trust Spock with his life. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then last, you know, final scene, they got the whales off. Um, I think the best part about that is um, Paramount actually shot that in their parking lot. Huh? Um, yeah, so there's like um, these tanks under um that parking lot area or whatever um they actually dug that up um filled the whole thing with water and then they shot that thing like in the parking lot <laughs> um according to william shatner at least well know. i wouldn't doubt william shatner he would never tell us a lie <laughs> you know how how reliable of a that. captain kirk you know the main character um but yeah that that was uh was a pretty cool part um i've got I think that about covers most of it. Um, and then I guess I guess all the way, very very final scene. Um, Kirk gets his whole uh, demotion, the demotion scene where the like, so oh, you know you guys saved the world and everything, so we'll drop all the charges except, except for one. Um, and we'll Kirk, uh, so we're gonna actually demote you. Yeah, um, it's not the the worst punishment ever, is yeah. it for him? Yeah, it was it was sort of like we have to technically, you know, penalize you, but we don't want to penalize you, so we'll do it in like this. We'll and it's not way. for him, is it? He doesn't want yeah. to be an admiral. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, and he gets his ship back. <laughs> Does yeah. anyone? I yeah. wonder if anybody ever wonders whether the whole whale probe was an inside job, because it's. <laughs> it's a bit suspicious that, you know, the crew's on the way back to Earth. They're probably all going to end up in jail. Oh, look, there's an emergency, and we just so happen to be able to fix it. Yeah. And Kirk's the one that figures it out as well. Yeah, just, mm, I'd be asking a few questions, that's all. Just say, if, if, all of, if all of <laughs> to demote Kirk back to captain. Yeah, if, if we had normal society, you know, if our society now existed... Um, in the Star Trek universe, there'd be people on YouTube going, you know, uh, the probe was fake news, it was an inside job, and I'm going to tell you why, and there'd be people protesting, and it, uh, it'd yeah. be crazy. It'd all be, crazy. be Bill Gates, all of his Yeah, name. there'd be whale probe deniers running around <laughs> going, no, 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 no. And obviously, with all these sort of denial things, like, it would be stupid, because... Why would you go to all the effort to go back in time twice, there and back, at the risk of your life, just to, well, you know? There's no other way they could have got the whales. They didn't so go where back did they in get time, the whales did from? they? They had them they anyway. The illusion. They're CGI whales. Fake whales. They brought them from Vulcan. They're actually Vulcan animals. Oh, Nobody's going to check. Nobody's it. seen a whale for 300 years. They're going to go, yeah, that's probably a whale. Yeah, and Kirk's brought along his own expert. Well, yeah, oh, here she is, look. She's an expert. Yep, that's a whale. <laughs> Don't believe it. Anyway, then, sorry, um, Alex. Yeah, I was going to say, um, best, best theme for last, but um, after Chekhov does his whole, like, okay, so they, they send, like, the two worst people to, like, go collect nuclear power. Like, <laughs> like your, your choices, you go back in time, 
to this specific point in time, and you pick the two people who would be most, I feel like, most suspicious on what, her, uh? people carrying nuclear power. Well, I mean, I can get Chekhov because of his accent, but why a her? Uh? I don't well, think it would necessarily that friendly to African American women yeah. in in the eighties. I mean, I don't know what San Francisco was like, but yeah. um, female and a minority on a ship with with nuclear power. Oh, I suppose you're right. Russian guy, like that's especially also. <laughs> but um, aside from that, uh, when they get him to the hospital. Um, just bones, just, just what, bones. Bones is awesome. Um, doctor gave me a pill, and I grew a new kidney. <laughs> they cut that on the ITV version as well. They cut that. Yeah. Do yeah. that. Yeah, I think I think it was just for time to go to fit into the time slot. Um. So yeah, they cut a couple of little scenes. He just hands her a pill, and it's like doctor gave me a pill. I grew a new kidney. I just, I just, the, the, my dad quotes that line all the time. Uh, I, I quote that too. Um, it's just, it's the best. It's, it's awesome. Um, but yeah, I think, think that about sums up the movie. Then we got the credits. The music's still awesome. The credits are still awesome. Everything's still awesome. And uh, I think that's the end. That's about it. Okay, uh, Alex Cersei, <laughs> have you got anything to add? <laughs> Um, I have just a couple of things I like that he didn't cover. I think she touched on it there at the end. I think Chekhov is very quietly the most humorous character in this film. Like, his bit in the hospital when he gets revived. Uh, when Kirk asks him what his plan to get the uh, photons off the ship are, he just shrugs and is all, uh, we'll beam in, collect the photons <laughs> and beam out. Like, oh, okay. Kirk's like, yeah, good luck with that. And I, it's just funny from beginning to end like the message about the whales too is good obviously still today um it's really cool seeing them get the enterprise a there at the very end also you know it just gives you that hits you right in the heart at the end um yeah i don't have much else to add pro wise for it joe have you got any more pros um i think i'm gonna echo what some of the stuff that's already been said i think that a lot that the characters is a really good character on song piece, especially like the way that they put people together who don't necessarily spend that much time together. I like the um, especially the use of Bones and Scotty together, especially like that moment where Scotty just hams it up when he's the professor and you know going you no know, angry about the fact that he's just come all the way millions of thousands of miles. And, um, I liked. I'm always going to be able to see Sarek. Um, I like the way that Fox character journey comes through and also how Sarek kind of makes a bit more make a bit of peace with Spock over some of the things, mm. including um, him going to Starfleet. It's also kind of sad because if you know about the future stuff in Next Generation, you find out that they kind of... Um, they kind of... Uh, did, they, they, there was another incident, you know, with the whole... Romulan unification thing that kind of broke the two apart for a while. Um, and then, of course, Sarek died. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of sad seeing that and knowing the stuff in the future. But Yeah, this is still, sort of good. their one nice moment, really. Mm -hmm. This is sort yeah. of the only time we see the two at peace with each other. Um, oh, sorry, guys. All I was saying was that's the equivalent of, like, Sarek, you know, smiling and giving Spock a hug. Like, that had to be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, and he's. I like Sarek. What can I say? I've always liked him. He's a good character. Um, what else? I like. I mean, just the whole everything. It's hard to find things to say about it because it's a it's a it's a shirt thing that really holds its um it put it wears its heart on its sleeve, and so the qualities about it that everyone likes are so are really apparent. I think Alex um, Alexander sort of pretty much covered every single one of them um so i think i'll have obviously i think we might have a few more neutral zones and stuff because there's some funny things going on that don't affect how i feel about it but um you know 
it's still um, some little quibbles and stuff, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Cool. Lenny, what about your pros? I have a lot. I actually went onto a second page. Oof. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I like the Challenger tribute at the beginning. Oh, oh yeah, I was going to say that. I forgot about that. Oh, this is why you make that. notes, guys. We normally do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I thought there was a nice diverse amount of aliens as well. Um, that probably is because most of the film is set in the 80s, so they didn't have to do loads of makeup. They could just have people sitting there with like a thing on their head. Um, but there was a lot of diversity. Uh, I think um, Alex Sandra touched on this. Um, the exposition of the last two films is not shoved down your throat. It it feels quite natural. I mean, it's there for, a, you know, the, the court scene and going to Vulcan and the conversations that I had are, they're there for a purpose, but they don't feel that they're, they're going, this is what happened last time. Yeah. So, which is, isn't that what happened in the last film? Didn't they go previously on? Did you guys not have the bit then? Because on my DVD version, it's got a bit where Shatner's doing a voiceover and he goes, my son was killed on the Genesis planet and we stole the... <laughs> Cling on the yeah. ship, and Spock's mind yeah. was restored, but his nope. mind was a blank. And now we, we have, have to decide. No? no, honestly, there's about a five minute thing. You well, guys got the better version then. <laughs> I just watched what was on Sky Movies. <laughs> Don't know about better versions. Um, but yeah, your version sounds crap. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know whether you noticed, but Starfleet Command were able to launch all vessels for a change and not uh-huh. just call the Enterprise to deal with it. Obviously, they couldn't try and go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, just, I just love the, the, the whole script. I think is brilliant. I can't, don't think I can fault the script. Um, I was saying that it's funny and I think, obviously, I think some people might find it a bit like oh, stop going on about how awful we are to the planet. Like, stop bombarding us with your messages. But I like it. I like that humanity is being critiqued. And for it to be done in the 80s as well. I mean, if you was to make something like this now, it wouldn't really necessarily be a shock um, because of all like, the climate change movement. Um, but, you know, calling us a, a primitive paranoid culture and illogical for hunting a species to extinction. And uh, and the humour, I think the the funniest stuff is um, Spock trying to use the colloquial language. Mm-hmm. Uh, phones in the hospital. Just, yeah, lo- love the script. Um, way on my meld, always a fave. And I just love San Francisco. Love it. Love I just love how it looks. I think it always looks brilliant on film. And it's a wonderful place, having been there. It's brilliant. So that's my pros. Okay, I don't think I've got a right lot more to add to that, really. I, Yeah, I think it's good that it's a fun adventure film because the, the last two are much heavier. And this one, even though it is dealing with big themes, you know, about the, the whales and like Lainey said, uh, but it, it is more of a romp, this one, which I enjoy. I like the fish out of water, if you'll pardon the pun, you know, that wasn't a whale joke. <laughs> but they're whales. They're mammals. Um, <laughs> well, exactly, but the fish out of water thing with the, the crew is always funny, you know, though. It's always good when you can take these characters that we have as our heroes and make them look silly in a way and still pull that off. It doesn't detract from the characters, even though we've been invited to laugh at them. So I enjoy that. And the new Enterprise is cool, even though it's exactly the same as the old Enterprise. It's just got an A on it. But it's still a really uplifting moment when they get the ship at the end and they just get to fly off and everything. So, yeah, I think everything really has been covered. But, yeah, I'm, I'll throw my hat in that this is this is a great film as well. Uh, Joe, you mentioned neutral zones then. Do you want to take us through your neutral zones? Okay, so we'll start off with the uh, piece of stupidity from me. I remember watching the film and then there was a line, the whales will drown. And I thought to myself, 
play him. That's silly. How can whales drown? And like about five minutes later, it's like, oh yeah, they're mammals. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bit of, uh, and that had nothing to do with the film. I just thought I'd bring it up because it was a bit, you know, it, it, where else are you going to put it but neutral zone? Um, <laughs> Giving an actual neutral zone now, let's talk about the fact that for some reason Joseph Sisko, Joseph Sisko mm-hmm. seems to be known as Admiral, uh, Admiral something. I don't oh, know right. how that quite happened. I guess there's just a lot of doppelgangers oh, about. Yeah. Yep. Yep. This isn't the first time this has happened, nor the last time. Mm-hmm. I mean, heck, we're going to get that in the next two films. One of the great actors of all time. Um, I've forgotten his name now. Uh, David Warner gets to be in two different films at the same time. I, I like to think that he gets to be in six because of how, as an apology for, what, for how, what, how five turned well, out. Well, weirdly, I asked him about that when I saw him at a convention and he actually preferred working on five to six. Well, there's no accounting for taste. Yep, there you go. And to be fair, working on a film is much different from actually the fine product. So I'm glad he had a nice time. It was because he, he didn't have to wear makeup and he could have yeah. a fag while he were working, so, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, good good on him. Glad you got to meet him. I, um, He's been in a lot of things I love, including the Men in Black <laughs> animated series. He was good in that. Anyway, that's not... That's not over there. Um, he's like, yeah, and uh. What? That was oh, good. you said Men in Black animated series? It was good. Oh, okay. That's, you know, I'm counting for taste. Oh. 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 We're, not go- we're not going there. We're not going to go there. I'll be there. I'll be going for ages. Um, it was. Um, I don't um, even know there was one. It was. Anyway, you'd have to see it to, to decide whether it was good or not. Let's let's not go there. Um, what else did I have to bring up? Um, where did the ship come from? Not the... Uh, and obviously the Klingon ship, they bought that. That's fine. But Still don't in the pre- no, no, not the not the uh, not the probe. I'm talking about the Enterprise A because uh-huh. in the previous uh-huh. film they decommissioned the original Enterprise, mm-hmm. right? And then they go and take out take it away, and it gets all exploded, right? Mm-hmm. And then they come back and they've saved the day. And so, okay, we'll bust you down to the, to, to Admiral Kirk, and here's two Enterprise, and like. Okay, so what was the previous plan? Were you all going to be split off to different ships? Did you suddenly just pull a ship out of your ass? I mean, there's, there's, it's, it feels a bit like the logistics just aren't there. And I know that it's a minor thing and it doesn't affect how I like the film at all. I just, it just bugs me a little bit. It makes me think that they probably did have the idea that we're going to, okay, we're going to scrap the Enterprise and we're going to make a new Enterprise and we'll put them all back where they were but we're not going to tell them. <laughs> that just seems so stupid. Why wouldn't you just tell them? The, the, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even, you know, I mean, obviously they had to go and get Spock back, but like, they could have just waited. Maybe they, they have, because like, oh, why don't you have this new Enterprise lying about and save Spock or something? I don't know. There is a non-canon explanation for that. I think in one of the books, uh, they say that it was actually another Constitution class ship uh, that they were building. The Yorktown. The Yorktown. And um, because of the heroics of the crew and everything in this one, they decide to rechristen it Enterprise A and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, there you that, go, Joe. You can just... sleep now. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, you know, that's what we have. Good night, everyone. That's why we have non canonical media. Is to yeah. With those little gaps. And this stuff. is so the that's... thing with Star Trek. Any question you have, someone will have written a novel that answers it. Although you have to be careful because you sometimes end up with what uh, TV Tropes calls the voodoo shark problem, which is when someone tries to fill in a hole and makes an even bigger hole. It was named after Jaws 3, where they decided the reason why the the Jaws shark was constantly after this particular family of people was because of a voodoo curse. And uh, that was much stupider. But, uh, you know, at least this one's answered. My final neutral zone is... I'm sure you're all happy to hear that it's my final new design. Again, nothing too serious. Um, but it's it's just a funny line that became much funnier in retrospect. Sulu's line. Ah, San Francisco. I was raised here. And like, you know, finding out that um George Takei is gay suddenly made that laugh funny because um, San Fran has quite a um, big LGBTQ scene. So it's just one of those lines that's just a little bit funny in retrospect, you know, not in a mad, bad way, just just 
it's just amusing, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like an inside joke that we weren't yeah, privy right? to at the time. Yeah, That's I mean, day, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if the rest of them knew because I don't know when he came out. To be fair, I, I, I think, think he came out in the nineties. But yeah, I think he came out publicly in the nineties. But he, again, from anecdotes that he's told at conventions and things, it, they they knew. You know, the the rest of the crew yeah. knew. Do you think? I mean, I don't. I don't want to pry, but do you think that might have been part of some of the animal, not animosity between him and uh, Shatner? I've no. I think that's just because Shatner's just a bit of a, you know, a bit of an arse. Yeah, I suppose that's true. But anyway, that, nah, but that's um, that's that's my neutral zones. Okay. Anyone else neutral zones? Lenny. Um. We had a bit of pre-show chat about the glowing probe. Ooh. Yeah, it's very phallic. And I thought, just whilst we were talking about it, actually, I remembered it wasn't Vija quite... Um, Yonic? Vaginary. Yeah, Yonic, yeah. Mm. Yonic? Yeah. <laughs> I've not heard that's, that that's, before. Yeah, it's like if, if things that are shaped like a dong are phallic and things that are shaped like a vaginary Yonic, that's the two different... Oh. I don't know. That's the official word. Well, well, I am going to use that word day. more often. <laughs> yeah. I wonder whether I just whoever's designing these things, you know, maybe just makes you wonder because it's so it's so obviously phallic. <laughs> anyway, maybe it's more of a reflection of me as a viewer. Who knows? Um, uh, when Kirk says no one pays attention to you when you swear. Um, that just made me think of something that I read yesterday about how it's important to swear appropriately in front of your children. That is a bizarre thing. Uh, that sounds bizarre. But to teach children how how to swear in a way that isn't offensive um, and isn't just coming out of your mouth all the time because it's so... It's so important to social communication and social grouping and building relationships and just generally getting by in society is how you swear and when you swear. So oh gosh. actually it's important to, you know, yeah. where if, you, if you drop a dish to go, oh, SH1T, um, obviously not to be going to your child, you're a little SH1T, that's not okay, but to show... When it's okay. Anyway, it just made See, me that's, that. See, that's interesting. I think I think we... This is like free therapy for me. Um, so I think I've just <laughs> just made a breakthrough. Because when, when I was a kid, I was told not only not to swear, but not to even think swear words. So I sort of had this, like, crazy sort of dialogue in my head that if I ever thought a swear word, I was... I, I, I like, had to try and repress the thought and... Aww. You know, it was it was really weird, and I'm just thinking maybe that explains a little bit about me. Mm, maybe. I mean, that's a bit sad, that. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I've, I've been brought up in a uh, religious household, so we don't not to swear. Um, that's just, but I've I found a way around it, is I just make sort of noises, like sort of dinosaur T-Rexy noises when I'm frustrated, and both better and worse, and I think people were more like, you weird, but I no, I quite like doing it. Okay. Well, um, what, people what will I, pay attention to you. But obviously, back to Kirk's point, people don't pay attention to you if you don't swear. <laughs> I think if you're roaring at people, yeah, that's going to get their attention, Joe. I was going to say what I did was, um, like I substituted like words from like books and movies into like what that swear was supposed to be. Ah. So, like. If I hated a certain character and I thought they were terrible, I'd use that, you know, for like the negative context. And if it was something you know I liked more, I'd try to find, you know, like a word that fit into that that like expressed that same emotion. Um, so, so like for example, um, in so in Lord of the Rings, um, there's this one um, character, uh, Fieldor who did not throw the ring into the fire, and that's why we have the entire Lord of the Rings. Um, so every time, like, obviously that was a mistake, so, like, every time you, like, I make a mistake, I'd be like, holy mother, steel door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that works. Like, 
this is a mistake. This is just this is the seal doer's fault. I blame him for my problems. Um, so that just if you say it enough, if you like constantly like stop and try to substitute each word, and you say it enough, like eventually you just you're walking around just like oh, I seal doer. You just you just substitute it subconsciously. So that's why I don't swear as much as I probably would. Um, not that I swear as a kid. I don't do that. What? No. <laughs> but, as, as, but you know, you're at school and stuff, and you have kids just, like, swearing because their parents don't let them at home, and they want to act cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, you know, I'm trying, like, yeah. I'm trying to no, I... at home, so, you know, I'm trying to, like, substitute stuff at home, so I'm like, oh, I can't say this word at home. Let me, let me try to say something else. Substitute. Yeah, no, I didn't swear that much at school. I don't think. My, my kids of my generation swear so, so much. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. Oh, but it's a very epic truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, who would have thought that we'd end up on this sort of linguistic exploration and child psychology and stuff? Oh, but so, uh, some punk on a bus. <laughs> yeah, that's how deep Star Trek Four is, that it takes yeah. us into these areas. Moving on. Nope. The glowing probe. Oh, no. In fact, isn't it true that because of its power, it vibrates? Yeah. They even say so. They vibrate the, vibrates the atmosphere. There, there, are so many, there are very many layers to this film. As I'm eating nuts. <laughs> I go eating nuts. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. My uh. nuts. Are we corrupting we, Alex? This is worrying. We need we need to be careful because Benedict thought we were hilarious on the last one and this might just kill him. So. <laughs> oh, I miss Benedict. I hope he can come back at some point. Yeah. It's just not the same. <laughs> I have a third neutral zone. Guys. Third neutral zone. Okay. Let's get to it then. Hurry up. <sighs> okay. So, clearly... Not enough people watched the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy. And if you haven't watched that and you like the messages from this film, I suggest you watch it. The end. Is it going to yeah? depress me if I watch it? Uh, it will make you um, find the whale slashing in the voyage home a little less distressing. Why does it tell you that <laughs> whales are evil? Nope. Oh. Okay. Find out for yourself, James. I know, because I don't like watching it's stuff like graphic. that that depresses me. I want to, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure just, I'll, I, I'll agree with the stuff it mm-hmm. says and I'll be like, oh, we should do something mm-hmm. about this, but... I, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to watch it in case it makes you do something good. <laughs> no, I don't want to watch it in case it makes me really depressed about the state of the world, so I feel like I've had enough of that over the last year or so. <laughs> so I mean, let's let's face maybe, it, though. There's nothing that we can personally do about most of these things. It's all down to the government. Is we can <laughs> steal <laughs> a Klingon <laughs> bird of prey. Fish. Stop eating fish. We can... I mean, even... No, because you see, the problem is, is even if a couple of people stop doing it, there's always going to be more people that are just going to keep doing it. Yeah, but that's why I talk on podcasts about watching documentaries about not eating fish. There we go. I don't eat a lot of fish anyway. So I'm allergic. There we go. I just I eat lettuce and potatoes. It's just it's just kind of it's kind of nuts because they say, "Oh, don't eat meat." Okay, well let's eat fish. And oh no, you're not supposed to eat fish either. What are we supposed to eat? Veg- I suppose vegetables. Veg- but, uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm I mean, I, I do. Documentary guys. No, I'm not going to watch. Here's the thing. I don't watch documentaries from Netflix. So I'm. I. Uh, what's the word? I'm dubious. Dubious of any de- um, documentaries on there because I do not trust its providence. Okay. Would it help you if uh, I knew someone that was in that documentary and I can tell you that they're a legit person with a legit passion and know what they're talking about? Well, at that point, I might as well watch it then, yes. You should watch the one about the exchange student who dies mysteriously in the hotel. That's a good one. Oh, I haven't watched that yet. And... Yeah, I've watched um, Why Did You Murder Me? Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't reckon much to that. It I mean, it looks... Oh. I mean, I, th- I I wanted to sort of watch it, and then I watched the trailer, and I was like, oh, gosh, it's one of these ones where everyone's awful. 
I don't want to watch the thing where everyone's awful. I need someone to root for. It's why I hated the Shadowlands. That, can... that, um, I keep going back to that bloody thing, and it's like 10, well, 15, five, five, 10 years old, that drama. But like, uh, don't get me started. You know, you've got to have try, someone. Try you Don't F With Cats. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I like the name. And watch, oh, yeah, watch Sea Spiracy and you can root for the fish. Um, yes. So does does anyone else have any neutral zones? No. Okay, let's do cons. I'm going to get my cons out of the way. And they are very, they are very few and far between. Um, this film does have a slightly weird structure when you look at it. Like... When you think about this film, you remember all the great stuff in San Francisco and blah, 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 and everyone says, oh, it's the one with the whales. And you know. But if you look at the actual timings of the film, there's about half an hour to 40 minutes before they go back in time. I don't think it drags or anything, but like listening to the, the main podcast, them guys were saying the first half of the film, but it's not the first half. It's only about 40 minutes or so, but it, it does feel longer and... When you watch it, you're like, it's actually quite a long time before we get to the bit that we think of as the film. And likewise... It's 50 minutes in before... It's around 50 minutes that it's the whale mind now. Yeah, and then likewise, I uh, I, I had to pause it when I was watching it and they just sort of um, beamed the whales up and there was about half an hour to go and it's like, that's quite a long time of film after the the climax of the action, you know, so I don't think it detracts from it too much and it's only really noticeable when you do take a step back and look at it structurally, but it, I think it's a testament to how good the film is, that it works despite the fact it's got this weird structure, but just, you know, from a, a narrative and structuring perspective, it's a little bit strange. Um, another one is the time travel thing, and this is only sort of a problem in retrospect, really. Be- but you get that bit where um, they say you're thinking of going back in time, and Bones goes, oh, sure, slingshot around the sun, build up enough speed, and you're in time warp, like, Really? It's that easy. It's that easy. You can just do it. And that would be fine in the context if it was just this film. But when you consider how many time travel problems we have in TNG, DS9, Voyager, (laughs) Discovery, you know, everything that comes after this, why don't they do, oh, sure, slingshot around the sun. You know, there's so many of these episodes where they go, oh, we've got to follow the anomaly back. And if we don't follow the anomaly, the world's going to be destroyed. And it if we miss our little window of time, everything's going to, you know, it'll be this way forever. And it's like, no, just show a new slingshot around the sun and it'll fix it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I give mean... people, like, the blueprint for designing some kind of new plastic and... Well, you know, I, I don't give, have a let problem. Let women grow kidneys and stuff, and that's all right. I don't have a problem with any of that stuff because it follows one of the major theories about time travel, which is two, two things. Either you can change the past or you can't change the past because the past has already happened. So anytime you go in, if you manage to go into the past, anything you do is the thing you're supposed to do anyway. Yeah. Because it's already yeah. happened. So, so what uh, Scotty said to Bones is probably completely correct. That is probably the guy that got, that did the, the transparent aluminium mm-hmm. and that, you know, that's just how that is. I think that's does, not really a problem. It does create the what is it, is it called the bootstrap paradox, where there is no origin point. So it, in this one, there is no origin point to transparent aluminium because Scotty can only give him the design for it because it existed in the future, but it only existed in the future because Scotty gave him the thing. So there's no origin point. And likewise with Kirk's antique glasses, there, there's no origin point for where they came from. They just go round and round and round. We don't know where they actually are. Mm. So, you know, but yeah, the, the actual mechanics of the time travel don't bother me. It's just the fact that it's thrown away so easily. This is probably because on, on our podcast, we did a whole series on time travel episodes and so many of them hinge on 
now is our time and we've got to do this solution now and if we don't do it, there's nothing we can do. And it's like, well, yeah, there is. You can just do a slingshot around the sun. You see, um, I have one final possible explanation. When you look at all the times it's happened, the slingshot around the sun, there is, in fact, one and only one constant between all of them. They yeah. have Spock there to do the oh, cal- oh, they have Spock there to do the calculations. True. So I think only Spock can do it. Only Spock. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Um, the other thing is when Kirk swims to let the uh, whales out. Um, huh? First of all, really good wig because that you know <laughs> that looks like it's proper hair moving about. Um, so that is excellent <laughs> wiggage. Um, but <laughs> there's a thing that I used to try and do and I stopped doing it because, you know, it could be dangerous. Um, when films used to have big, big underwater sections, I used to try and hold my breath for as long as the characters are underwater <laughs> to see if it's possible. This one I've done is, that. Yeah. They, have you ever managed to get all the way through this scene? No. No. It's down there for over a minute. Yeah, it's a really long time. And, I mean, it's not Alien Resurrection stupid, but it is too long to be holding your breath underwater unless you're Tom Cruise or Kate Winslet, apparently. She's, like, set a world record or something now. Um, So, yeah, so that was my other other con. Unbelievable holding of breath by William Shatner. Um, You didn't notice the much thinner stunt double then? No. No, I didn't like? actually. Oh. No, I was too focused on the wig. <laughs> I was looking at the tum tum. Right. Um, but again, if it was a stunt double, he wouldn't be wearing a wig. Well, he might be. It, it, Not if, that we know. If we don't know what good, the stunt double look like. If you're a good stunt double exactly. and you were playing a man who wears a wig, you would have to shave your head and put a wig on to make it look realistic. That's good. That's how stunt men work. And there's shots with Chatner's face. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, have you got any any cons? Uh, only two. Firstly, when they go back around the sun for the first time, that trippy sequence, completely pointless, ridiculous. No, you didn't need it. Especially since they didn't do it on the way back. So it's just like, well, why didn't you do it on the way back? You know, it just feels like, oh, we've, we've got like a minute we don't have anything to do with. Let's just put some trippy stuff on the screen. <laughs> and secondly... I don't like the closing credits. It makes it look like it makes Damn. it look like an old sixties television show, and I'm like, it's a film. I'm just saying that's just not my style. I understand if other people might like it, and it's only a small problem. I mean, come on, I'm not saying that like anything major is bad. But... It was very popular in the eighties, wasn't it? Doing these where I think I can't remember which. Uh, I think it's the We Hate Movies podcast. They call it a victory lap. Where you get like little clips from the film at the end to sort yeah. of celebrate, like, hey, you've just watched a great movie. I mean, with, but again, <laughs> because it's mostly done by television shows, it just makes it feel like a television show, and that's just not the sort. I think that's why they stopped doing it because they realise people did that association in their minds. I mean, there's a degree of irony in you critiquing a Star Trek movie for feeling like a television show, but. <laughs> well, let us not forget that my one of my biggest critiques of. of a film that's that's coming up is that it feels like a giant episode of the TV show. And in fact, that was my critique of almost my t- critique of one and three in some ways. But anyway, let's yeah. not let's not go on that. Anyway, <laughs> so is that is that all your cons, Joe? Yep, only two. It's a really good film. What can uh, I say? Okay, Alex Cersei. I I really had to stretch, especially after hearing everyone else talk. Uh, one of my cons, and it's kind of hard to say a con, but I mean. It's not really anything else. I don't think Savick should have been in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, she doesn't she doesn't hurt the movie, but the minute and a half she's in it just doesn't need oh, to be wow. in there. And I get in the I get in the book for three and four, like she and Spock had sex and she's pregnant and stuff, but we don't see her know that, so she doesn't Wait, need now? to be here. That in the novels sense. for three and in the novel for three on Gen- on the Genesis world, uh, she and Teen Spock while well, she's going through Ponvar have sex. I mean, in the novelization, yeah. In the novelization for four, she tells him she's pregnant with his child before he leaves, like on that scene on the ship there. That was originally planned to be in the movie, and they cut that out. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I mean to. Oops. Sorry. 
Oh, no, I was just going to say, and touching on the transparent aluminum part, they did cut to a part where Spock got asked that question on Vulcan from the computer, and, you know, it was the guy they give the formula to. Like, who invented it, and the answer was the guy, Bones, who got to give the formula to. Yeah. Nice. That's clever. Yeah, it is, but as I said, it does create that that weird thing of, you know, where did it originate from? It's kind of like, this is why I don't think time travel will ever be invented, because if it is, you'd just go back in time and invent it. You know, so you could just will it into existence that way, but yeah. Um, Lenny, if you've that's got what, any... That's all. Oh, sorry, Alex, carry on. No, I was just saying that was, that was all. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I just remembered one. That um I forgot. Sorry to butt in there. You were mentioned yeah. about things being cut out. What happened to what happened to Nurse Chapel? She was like she was there and like for a couple of the scenes and that was like apparently she was like supposed to be in much more of the film and they cut all her parts out except for one and she doesn't even like she gets one line and that's it. Mm. And that's just a bit rubbish. Yeah. Um, but that there we go. Lenny, if you've got any cons? Um, cons, then. Cons, con, con, con. Um, I, I touched on this earlier. Um, so you've got all these experts on Earth, like, freaking out about how they're going to communicate this whale, and then, the, sorry, probe. Um, and then Kirk's on uh, his Klingon ship, and he's like, oh, like, do this to the frequency. And they fix it. They're like, they solve it. It's like, and that's why it feeds into your conspiracy that mm-hmm. it's all yeah, it's all it's fake news. False flag. Yeah. Uh the time travel graphics, someone's already mentioned those, they were hideous. Um Okay, maybe maybe this is just me missing something, but why could the ship not locate where the nuclear weapons were? Why did they have to send the Russian walking around the streets asking for nuclear weapons? Uh, because it was funny. <laughs> Excellent, that, thank you. That's it. Um, and my final one is the Benny Hill music with Chekhov running around <laughs> the submarine yeah, or whatever, it's... and then cut, getting out of the hospital and stuff. So it was just, I was like, no, 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 it's too much. It was too much. I'd never made the the connection before, but that has now that will never go, go. away now. I've now ruined it for you. Yeah. So, um, Alex, Lisa, have you got any cons? Oh, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so shall we had... rank in the film then? So for anyone who's not been paying attention, our ranking of the definitive Star Trek films goes like this. So <clears throat> in the number one slot is the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. No. No, no yeah. don't yeah. even That's... joke. That please, was the, please, can the, you do it? Because I want to make it. I want to make so a note. It's, so that we can... the number one slot is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yeah, thank you. Number two is Star Trek Two. Oh, number three is um, Rocky Four. Number four is Star Trek Three. Number five is Ant Man and the Wasp, and number six is Star Trek One. What did you do while I was away? <laughs> well, terrible ranking. Joe, well, we it, watched the Zack Snyder Justice League. Yeah, it, the, That's what happened. the thing is, Joe, it wasn't much fun in the early days because it was like, oh, Star Trek the motion picture, where does it go in the ranking? Obviously, it goes number one. Star Trek 2, is it better than Star Trek 1? Of course it is. So it got a bit dull, so we started slinging okay. other films in that. Right, I get that. But now, you see, now we've got four. I think we, I think we should jettison those other ones. Maybe, maybe. We will see. It's motion picture, Star Trek 3, Rathacon. Yeah, but I'm getting confused. All right, so if we're just doing Star Trek films, as we probably should, it goes 2, 3, 1 at the minute. So I think... I don't... I think, you know, going by how we've generally been positive, I think the only question really is, does this go at number one or does it go below Wrath of Khan? I... I didn't think it did, but having watched it and really enjoyed it, I think 
think it's better than Wrath of Khan. So one thing I better than Wrath of question, Khan. Alex I think Cersei. the real question is, if we don't make it number one, will Alexandra kill us? <laughs> well, I, I mean, considered it. We're kind of okay, so we're on a different continent, so it'll take her a while. She can't enter our country without good reason, so... Exactly. Where? So where's... Yeah, Red yeah, Stone. She's in my country. Exactly, oh, so oh. that that's why it's more pressing for you. Um, so... Well, then it's, well, it's, it's, the, it's the best one, then. Okay, so that's two for <laughs> the top spot. Joe, where would you put this? I'm going to say that I can't pick between the two, so I'm abstaining. Ooh. I will take. I will. I will vote. Because I will vote. I will vote if James makes me the tie. Not if he doesn't. Okay. It can't be a tie because it's three, it's now. already three. It's already three for number one. Yeah, spot. I'm assuming Alex, you're gonna put it as number one. Obviously. Okay, oh, yeah. so right, that's then. a done deal. Um, so thank you. You saved me from making a difficult decision. So the official ranking now, obviously, it's not as good as Zack Snyder's oh. Justice League. So that's still say. number one. <laughs> but I don't know. Actually, hang on a second. Is it? I think it's. I think it's um, better than the first half of Zack Snyder's Justice League. <laughs> Ooh, controversial. But that's can it. it be end of Justice League, Star Trek, or? Beginning of Justice League, Wrath of Khan. No, because Zack Snyder's Justice League <laughs> is the greatest thing ever made in the universe, ever. So, it it's will always ever. be number one. Always. If we're doing Justice League, I want to put Fellowship of the Ring in there. Oh, no, if we throw Fellowship of the Ring in, we're getting into dangerous why, territory why is, now. Why would you put Fellowship <laughs> in over Two Towers? Because it's better. Two Towers, two towers. Two towers is easily the best. Of no, those. Two, two Towers, towers has... Return of the King. Return of the King is the best one, but Two, no, t- two, no, towers, two towers has... Is no, no, Joe, well, sorry. Them, I'm sorry, I two... have the critics on my side here. You do have the critics on your side, but they too are wrong. Um, the, <laughs> the Two Towers has serious, serious structural issues and it has serious pacing them. issues and narrative issues. And it's partly an inherited problem because that book is so difficult to adapt. Um, and they did a really good job with it, but it has major, major problems. If you look somewhere around the middle of a film, we end up with Saruman has a voiceover for about 10 minutes. Galadriel has a voiceover for about 10 minutes. Elrond chirps in at some point. And the, the, the sky. But the reason they have to do that is because the film has major structural problems. So the the battle scenes are spectacular, but oh, hello. as a film, I don't think it holds together as well as the other two. But anyway, we'll save that for the, the Tolkien cast. Ooh, I wonder if anyone's got the URL for that. No, we're not, don't, don't even open that up, lady. We're not going there. No, I, felt I don't I have the energy. Dead. I do not have the energy to withstand another salad rant. Alan I, Brand I can't. Let the rant come in. Uh, that oh, isn't a rant. That was just a bit of film criticism. I think that's reasonable. <laughs> and I, I think like my funny. points were valid. Anyway, um, so yeah, we won't throw the Lord of the Rings films in. Let's just right. What is the greatest film ever made? Let's just let let's just have it out. All right. Ooh. Start the voice home. Stash right for the so Voyager. I'll answer on the next cast because I'm going to need to think about it and write stuff down. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be wrong no matter what I say because it could be like, I don't even know how many movies, but I'll have an answer next time. I can't give an answer to the best film is, but in terms of my favorite, uh, my mm-hmm. favorite is an animated film called When the Wind Blows, which Ooh. is based on a Raymond oh, Briggs thing. Yeah, it's yeah, about... Yeah. About the about the old couple that gets blown up by blown up by nukes. Yeah, yeah. good one. I'd still say the heart, the heart, you know, makes me cry every time. So that's my that's my pick. Yep, cool. Lenny, greatest film ever made. I don't. Uh, greatest film again. I I don't know, but my favorite film, and I'm going to sound so basic. I love Independence Day. Yes. Uh, Oh, Look, yeah. that, is, that is classic. Favorite I have film. seen it. 
<laughs> you need shock. Independence Day. It's awesome. You um, shouldn't really be shocked, Lainey. You know. I, I know. Oh, well, sarcasm. No, sorry. We should do. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut out so much of this now because we're, ju- we're just rambling. But it's oh, all good. I, leave it in. Leave it. We in. should leave do a live podcast on the Fourth of July. <gasps> Joe yes. should watch Independence Day, and then we'll do a podcast on Independence Day live on the Fourth of July. Oh, we might as well. Yeah, yeah. why not? Why I not? That would be fun. There you go. I love. It. I will. So I will say it up. Um, we can do that definitely. Uh, and Joe, you can sing the American national anthem to like Why is he gonna lead us in there. Oh, Alex sings as well, yeah. Because yeah. Joe, Joe sings, but um, yeah, whoever. I bet um, Alex is better than me, so I'll let. There him we go. So I then... can't hit the high. So, so Alex, if you you sing it, and I'll um I'll do the backing track for you. How's that? All right. On my um, keyboards. I'll. But just. Right. Just be prepared. It probably won't sound normal, but it will sound interesting. I'll stand and take my hat off. Um, yeah, I do like the American National Anthem. I think it's excellent. It's um, better than ours. Oh, I think, ours again, is just atrocious. Well, no, you, see, no, you see, I don't think ours is bad. I think ours is literally the, the most meh album. Like, it's the bar. Yes. If it's better than ours, it's a good al- anthem. And if it's worse than ours, it's a bad anthem. Mm. It's the same as ours. It's just literally... Land five out of ten. The problem I have with ours is like I don't like the tune and I don't like the sentiment, so it's just like, uh, can we get rid of it? Let's have Land of Hope and Glory or Jerusalem. Oh, anyway. gosh. No, let's Jerusalem. not even. Let's not. Let's, yes, let's not. Let's, let's not. Let's not even go there. Let's not bring your whole Mackism thing out on the public. It will be here all night. I mean, the problem with okay. Land of Hope and Glory, of course, is that it makes you think of Macho Man Randy Savage. But oh, why wouldn't you want to? That's a fair point. Um, anyway, right, so moving on. Um, I don't have any alternative fun facts this time, but I do have what I learned from Shatner and Nimoy's commentary track. So an early highlight is when they're describing something and Leonard Nimoy uses the word monastic and Shatner says, hey, monastic, great word, say it again. And Nimoy goes, monastic. And Shatner goes, that's good. (laughs) So then when they first hear the whale sound, Shatner goes on and describes how he once did a one-man show where he read the poem, you know, that they they mention briefly in this, they say the sea is cold. Um, Yeah, and apparently Shatner did a one-man show of that with a backing track of whale sound that had been electronically tampered with to give it a beat um so i don't know if there's clips of that out there but that could be interesting oh, wow the <coughs> thing that he gave the thing that he managed to give a stage to a better singer than him yep there you mean, go. that's not too hard though to be fair and then there's a bit where they're talking about deforest kelly and sort of lamenting the fact that he's no longer with us and shatner goes off on this rant um about how to see yourself captured younger on film. And he says, all of us captured on film until it decays at a much slower rate than our bones do. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, no. Film decays at a much faster rate than bone do. He's talking about your skin. Skin decays fast, but bone decays slower. Yeah, it's one of them where I think the sentence ended up somewhere he didn't anticipate it doing at the beginning. Uh, much, I mean, much like those this, are the best sense, best sentences. To be fair, true. But. Much like this next one that he said so when the they're in the din- the scene where Kirk has dinner with um, Gillian, Shatner says that he thought he played it too carefully in that scene, and he explains this statement by saying, "There is a line between improvisation and delivering the written words, but there is something else. It's like archery." When the ideal time to loose the arrow is when it surprises you. Okay, I don't think so, I get that. No, I don't think he does either. Um, but then <laughs> towards towards the end of the film, he leaves us with an amazing pearl of wisdom. And he says, okay, so we've seen one, two, three, four films in this series. The next number is five. <laughs> if only he had the 
with him. Yeah. Oh, that would be the best cameo. Maybe he's the one that asked the questions. Maybe. They had to cut him out because they, his agent wouldn't let him. Yep. So there you go. That's the wisdom of Bill Shatner on um, <laughs> Star Trek IV. And I think that about brings us to the end of, uh, of this round table. We'll be back next time to talk about, oh my God, Star Trek V. Brilliant. Oh, I'm looking, I'm looking, I've never watched it all the way through. I'm very Ooh, excited. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm very brilliant. well. I know this very well. I know it too well. I've seen. I don't know why I've seen this film as many times as I have. I mean, you know, you guys. We just talked about like the greatest films ever made, and I've seen Star Trek Five more than any of those films, which is just. <laughs> Which is just the an, thing is, an awful, and like, awful thing. I, 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 yeah. Maybe, but the thing is, like, honestly, and I've said this before, like, the worst the Star Trek film get, you know, when you look at the worst that Star Trek films get, and you look at how bad other films are, mm-hmm. you, you kind of feel a bit nicer about it, you know? Like, yeah. it's bad, but it's terrible. And Fair. that's kind of nice. It makes you feel better about the series. Like, if the worst Star Trek could be is kind of bad, but in an enjoyable way, then, yeah. you know, it's, it's a good series then, isn't it? Really, if that's the worst it can be, uh, except for Code of Honor. And that, <laughs> that, that episode can go for so. Oh! Oh! Shots fired! <laughs> well, we were talking about swearing and when the right time to do it was. Yeah. Uh, it might well have been done. it. Uh, but you can always you can always blank it out if you need me to. Yeah. Wait, we need to I mean, yeah. you, I'll, I'll you echo Jonathan Frank's sentiment about that episode. So yeah, <laughs> and I think on that bombshell, then we'll um, we'll say goodbye. Goodbye, My everybody. Are gonna kill me for this. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. There once was a ship, but to the skies the name of the ship was the Enterprise. Her nacelles lit, her phasers armed, oh blow, you red shirts blow. Soon may the flagship come, bring a survey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Been not two weeks from sector one when we were sacked by Romulans. Red alert was called, oh, and captain said, torpedoes make it so. Soon may the flagship come, bring a survey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Before our foe had reached the hull, the shields were raised and power at full. Screen went dark, the Romulans gone when they engaged their cloak. Soon may the flagship come, bring a survey tea and Orion rum. One day when the scanning is done, engage and boldly go. Up your shaft.